Live from Risen Bull, this is Drill Trains of Thought. Hi, Tim. Hello there. So it's nice and sunny here, which is a, a good change from um, it Indiana. It is very nice. I, I feel like the podcast heard a lot of our complaining because it's been taking us to a lot nicer locations yeah, lately. Yeah, we were in some bad places there for a while. Yeah, and this is this we were. is good. So this is this it's is all sunny, right. blue sun, skies, yeah. ni- little, peaceful farming community. Lord, let me a little bickering from that older male house. Yeah, it seems like there are being tools thrown around and stuff. Yeah, but, I don't know what. To uh, do hey, with. I'll take it for the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah, that dog seems pretty friendly anyway. Yeah. So that's good. So uh, we're here for episode uh, 53. 53. Um, I guess we might as well just jump right in to mm-hmm. Story School. All right, Tim, this was your idea. Well, actually, it was kind of both of our ideas. We <laughs> thought, hey, it's February. There tends to be some sort of holiday there that people like to celebrate. Something about, uh, I think it's called a uh, Singles Awareness Something day. like that. Yeah, it was very close to that. Yeah. Um, sad day. A uh, very sad day. <laughs> so we thought we'd do some sort of uh, romance-related one. We've done a strictly romance episode back, like, way back when. Yeah, a while ago. But we thought we'd do uh, romantic. It was your idea, I think, the romantic side plots. Yeah, romance as a side plot. As a side plot, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Where it's like, you know, it's not the main story, but it's certainly an important part of the story. The general, you know, action movie thing where you got the girl and the guy saves her, and at the end, you know, there's a kiss or a, hey, I'm going to go on some of her date thing. Basically, where the romance is not the main focus, but is kind of a nice ingredient. To it's the a mix. nice spice, yeah. It's a good spice. It's, it's boom. Not like, you know. Spicy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Add flavor. <laughs> so let's, I guess, maybe start out with a, I, I did my vague example, a really good solid example. Okay, well, one the one I threw out when we were first talking about this was like Han and Leia in Star Wars. Especially Empire Strikes Back. Especially Empire Strikes Back, because that's a very important subplot in it. I mean, arguably, in Empire Strikes Back, you have a couple different, you know, Han and Leia have about as much screen time as Luke and Yoda. Yeah. Not that sounded weird. The, the, <laughs> Luke and Yoda are in a re- I'm sure someone different kind of relationship. But. <laughs> but, okay, anyway, but uh, but at the same point, I mean, who's the overarching story of Star Wars really about? Well, it's primarily on Luke, Luke, yeah. Luke the, the Skywalker's father and son, but and the, sister and father. <laughs> Sorry, not really. But but uh, but Han and Leia is a very important romantic subplot in it, and uh, very memorable in that movie, and. Uh, and it really dif- different helps differentiates their relationship in that movie than from say the first Star Wars, A New Hope, yeah. where well, it's kind of this just they come at each other. You can tell there's maybe something there but, that could happen, but right. But they're just I mean they just met each other, yeah. so you don't really I mean it's not yeah and, yeah. And in, in in Empire Strikes Back, the romance you know in some movies the romance feels like it's just kind of shoot horned in because you have a romance in a story to make it cool, yeah. especially in action movies. I mean that's kind of the the Mm-hmm. It's a trope, I guess. Um, but in Empire Strikes Back, it it also seems to reveal sides of people's, of, especially Han's character, yeah. that you you didn't get previously, and you might not get outside of a story like that. Yeah, it's interesting with Han because yeah, in the first one, he's he does feel very he's very smug and he's he's, he's he feels very all surface. Yeah, yeah. to to an extent. Empire Strikes Back, he starts off. Still kind of smug, thinks the princess is all over him. He has this kind of assurance in it, but at the same time, you do get a better sense of he actually genuinely cares for her yeah. quite a bit, wants to protect her, and and eventually vice versa. And and that sort of you know we're talking about these uh, side plot, uh, romance of the side plot. I mean, it does add a lot of tension. You care about what happens to these characters even more because they care about what each other, mm-hmm. and it just adds uh, interest. That as if they were just they just. Didn't you know they were just bickering for no good reason? <laughs> right. You right. know. I mean, the bickering is fun, but at yeah. The same but time. I mean, if it was, it was just there for bickering, you'd be nice, maybe. You know, yeah. but not the, quite the same as this. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Princess, <laughs> nerf herder, whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, and a lot of what romance's side plot can add is a, is an easy way. Well, I mean, not easy if you're not doing it right, but it's a way to bring more emotion into a story. Take uh, the Final Fantasy series yeah. for example. I mean, that's the case. They they do emotion, p- 
particularly well when it comes to the romance in there, whether, you know, Final Fantasy VII, Cloud and Tifa, uh, Final Fantasy IX, you've got uh, Zidane and Garnett. Locke and Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> in six. <laughs> Although Locke has, like, you get little teases of his relationships with a like, couple, the, the, yeah. the, other, the other woman in you there. Feel, yeah, he's kind of Han Solo in the... <laughs> I mean, like, I think Rachel was the one, and then after that he just kind of does this, I play the... Right. Well, it, not as much as Setzer, but... Well, yeah. Well, Set, Setzer's the player, Locke, but Locke has... He wants to protect, you know, he's like, he needs someone to yeah. run around protecting. Basically. Yeah. But anyway, in, in each of these cases... <laughs> yes, we are talking about these little square guys on <laughs> the Super Nintendo game. But in each of these cases, these romantic relationships give us a opp- good opportunity for some of Nobu Matsu's beautiful romantic <laughs> ballads. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> and, so, and that's where, you know, some of the great emotion of the games really comes from. I mean, sure, you got, you know, Seven's got Sephiroth and all that stuff, but... I think part of the reason why, spoiler alert, Aerith dying, <laughs> or Aerith dies main matters is because Cloud had yeah. a, this thing with it. There was some chemistry there. Well, and the thing with, uh, I guess I never quite thought of in these terms, the thing with romance is, especially for your guy character, it almost always reveals a side that doesn't get touched and another plotline could not reveal. Mm. You know, there's just that angle that doesn't come out in other types of relationships. Yeah. Um, especially, especially when you have the strong lone wolf, wolf sort of characters in, you know, like Cloud and whatever, you get this this angle that just, you know, this vulnerability that also just makes a person a character more nuanced mm-hmm. from romance that you don't get if they were just with normal other non romantic relationships. I mean, it could, but it doesn't. I guess we're not programmed to see it as often. That's a good point. And, I mean, it, it goes both ways. I mean, most of the time it's, like, the tough guy that some, you know, the woman, like, speaks to the inner, yeah. you know, Sue's inner demons. But sometimes you get the reverse where there's a really tough woman character. And then, like, in um, uh, Wreck-It Ralph, the, yeah. there's that one, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that one tough military That's a good example. Chick. <laughs> and, uh develop this relationship so yeah. then it's not just an angry person it's like oh there's this softy underneath yeah I, I guess I've never seen that just as we were talking that out but it is certainly uh, and I think it's true in real life sometimes when a friend you had suddenly has a girl you're like what side is this person I've never seen this thing you know <laughs> and so it plays that out in fiction mm-hmm Okay, so we talk about some good benefits of uh, romance as a side plot, and well, I'm sure we'll get into this more in a minute. Yeah. But let's differentiate from some of the bad ones. Well, I, I think the bad ones, some of them come about just because it's become such a, you just kind of expect. If there's a guy and a girl, and they're leads in the thing, they're going to fall in love. Yeah. It just happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, so many times because we've seen it so often, because it's what we expect, because apparently in a movie, if there is a guy and a girl, they must at some point kiss. And sometimes especially if they're bickering. I think, Ex- yeah. I think Roger Ebert said one time, that like, if two characters, a guy and a girl, begin a movie and they can't stand each other, we will not be satisfied as an audience until they get together. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but because it's happened so often, it's become such shorthand that a lot of movies just... They just phone it in. Yeah. You know, it just, you don't feel like it's real. You feel like it's there because that's what you're supposed to do. Mm hmm. And we talked in the previous episode about the the Bechtel test. Yeah. Where basically you kind of evaluate, well, does this female character have an actual role in it or is she just the girlfriend? Is she just the damsel you know, in distress or whatever? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes the romance is kind of shoehorned into that. It's like, it's a reflection on that. It's like, oh, you just shoehorned that in because even though these two characters have been together the entire movie and have sort of a partner chemistry, they don't really have a romantic chemistry, yeah. but you kind of force it anyway. Before, because that's what you do, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. I just watched um, Jupiter Ascending. Oh. On last a couple of days ago. I'm trying to figure out whether to congratulate you or condole you. I actually, I well, my expectations were very low. Yeah. Because uh, Zach and Brianna had gone and... Um, but I kind of really enjoyed it. I mean, it's not a perfect movie by any means, but there's a lot of good things about it. Okay. And I feel like it's one of those movies that because it's so science, it's so its own world, it's very hard to sell it to you well. Like John Carter about the best version that I've ever seen. Okay. Whole new world, crazy ideas, mm-hmm. sold it to me. Okay. But most movies have a hard time doing that. Sure. Anyways, there's problems with it, but the main character is a girl. Jupiter Jones. I keep trying to call my Serenity. I always call her Rennie Jones. I try to call her Jupiter Jones. She's like, no, Mars Jones. Mars. She, she loves Mars. She, um, she, she, loves, she loves pretending to be an astronaut. Makes perfect sense. So anyways. But that one's a weird combination because she's running around with this, you know, this lone wolf, actually, pun intended. Uh, you've seen that. And you're just like, okay, he's trying to save her or whatever. And she's the main, obviously the main character. And then suddenly there's this scene where she's like, Basically, I'm in love with you. And you're like, what? Where did that 
come from? <laughs> but after that revelation, after they felt like it was shoot a horn, and after that, it worked really well. After we just you just bought into the fact that okay, uh, I didn't sure go sure away. yeah. I mean, you were saving me, and apparently now I'm madly in love with you. Um, but <laughs> after that, it played pretty well. It mm-hmm. didn't feel the rest of it did not feel shoehorned as much once they just kind of you know slapped you over the side kind that of with ham fisted way. And I thought it was an interesting you know combination. So because both of them were actual characters in their own right. I mean, she did stuff besides just fall in love, and he did stuff besides just right. I, well, I guess some people have said the Matrix sort of did something like that where. You know, both same, same guys. I mean, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Well, you know, both Neo and Trinity are you know fairly interesting characters yeah. in their own rights. But then at the very end of the movie, you get the Trinity saying, well, "I fell in love with you, so you must be the one," sort of thing. And you're like, I mean, I guess I could see how some people. I don't know if it bothered me much at the time, but I can see how some people would yeah. be like, "Okay, there really wasn't that much." talk of this beforehand yeah. yeah and i don't know if that's just something the wachowskis do you know maybe that just kind of you know <laughs> yeah it's one of those things it just happens and oh. they don't need to set it up but it was, it was an interesting you know half and half sure um because sometimes you just get the i'm going to just say the you know the 80s action movie where like <laughs> rescue the girl you know you tell her to do stuff she fights you back and yeah. at the end you're mad you know maybe a lot of times you know they were they were in love and then they're not now, and then they get right. you know almost killed by people, and then they're in love. I mean, and some of that's sort of the Bond mentality. Yeah, that, you know, anytime Bond has a woman that he's rescuing or going on an adventure with for some reason, then you know, at the end of the mo- by the end of the movie, they're gonna at least have one kiss. Well, and the thing is, I mean, I guess in real life, just from adrenaline and shared experience, that might very well happen. Well, it's not really romance. <laughs> True, true. No, I mean, in the cases where it has been done well, I'd say like Casino Royale, mm-hmm. where at some point... You feel like there's an actual connection for the Bond. Yeah, they have an actual connection at, you know, because they both share in their vulner- vulnerabilities yeah. at a, you know, some critical moments, and then that kind of develops the connection, and then at the end of that movie, it kind of gets torn apart. Yeah, yeah. Very badly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but... Which is why that's a really good Bond movie. Yeah. <laughs> One reason. But uh, an action movie that does it well, let's say uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Marion is a pretty cool girl. I mean, she does wind up having to get saved quite a bit, but at the same time, she, you know, she she can hold her own with a frying yeah. pan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rapunzel. <laughs> um... <laughs> And uh, she's she's feisty. She's I mean it's then and there's some history in their relationship. It's not just yeah. that like they just got thrown into this and the thing, together. And the, and the thing is, you know, people like to get down on tropes, but tropes are there because they work and because I mean, when done well, yeah, they're fun. You know, being rescued as I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. The damsel in distress idea. As long that, as you're just not just just that. do yeah yeah exactly as a as a as a element seems. Good. And a lot of it, I think, really depends on, you know, are you making these real characters? And I think the Bachelor de- test is a decent, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, I, I don't like to judge movies on that necessarily, but I think to make your romance more realistic if that's not the only thing the girl's there for. Right. And you do have to keep in mind what kind of movie you're watching. If you're watching a very escapist movie with, you know, you just want the the... The highlights. You, you're not looking for a movie that like deals under the consequences of what are we doing? Yeah. What, war is bad, <laughs> and you know all all this kind of stuff. You you just want the good guys to defeat the bad guys, and you know some kind of. And um, as Christians, we do kind of have to be careful that we're not going too far into the sensationalist of this sort of thing. Yeah. But there is still something very you know kind of idealist and and good about. I don't know about seeing two people come closer together because of you know situations yeah. they've been through. Anything, it's like yeah, I no, I agree. And just you know, even if it's an escapist, you can at least make a not a cardboard character. Yeah, you know, and I think that's a lot. Of, that feels a lot of it. You feel like that things actually happen where they they connected at a real level and not just on a sexual um, sexual. Or, or, yeah, or sometimes not even that. Sometimes just like, and we we're in the same place at the same time, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or like, I happen to be the prince, and you happen to, you know, be madly in love with me for no good reason. Enchanted, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's some. Oh, well, let, let's talk about another as, aspect of romance side plot, and that's the love triangle. Ah, the love triangle. Because I, I don't think I'm love triangle is quite pr- uh, strong enough as a. Cat- as a story school on its own, so let's let's squeeze yeah. I'm not it in particularly here. fond of the love triangle normally. Yeah, I know some people can't stand them. Zach can't stand them <laughs> in any sense. And I think the problem is this: that many times it feels manufactured simply for drama. Yeah. And it, and here's the thing: it is there for drama. I mean, almost every case it is. Yeah. The trick is if you can f- if it feels like 
and again for different people, I think it's different levels. Different you can, mileage. You can see the you can see the strings that they're just doing it simply for the drama, not because this would really happen or because it's a good idea or you know just mm-hmm. we will now insert person B at this worst possible moment, not because it makes any good story sense, just because it hurts. <laughs> um, yeah. But okay, well, so can it be done interestingly? Well, let's look at one of our favorite topics: Lost. Uh, oh, I was gonna say something else. <laughs> or yeah, Hardy Boy. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I beat you to it. Okay. Um, you know, okay, you've got your Kate and Sawyer and Jack and Jack. Thing. Juliet. Well, Juliet, and then it becomes a, a uh, quadrangle, quadrangle <laughs> something. Okay, Jack. Aaron. And, Jack and Juliet never made a whole lot of sense to me. No, that one was. I mean, that that, one, that one did feel forced. Well, and except it also felt like Jack was forcing it on purpose too. That kind of helped a little. That's true because he was kind of hurting from the Kate Anyways, and Sawyer that's thing. Never there, but I mean, no, but the Jack Sawyer Kate thing you can sort of see because Kate has kind of both sides to her, and I think that's a place, a, a case where it come it stems from the character. You know, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't feel forced on Kate. That feels a very Kate thing. Now you might still be annoyed with it because you might be annoyed <laughs> with Kate. Yeah. But at least it's honest to her character. See, in many, in most of the instances, because she's got the case of wanting to kind of be good like Jack, but at the same time she has this, you know, kind of shady background like Sawyer. And she kind of wants to, you know, she identifies with the hurt of Sawyer as well, and mm-hmm. and kind of the hurt of Jack. I mean, she's kind of like, I will just make people feel better. <laughs> Yeah. By helping them when we don't want help. That's Kate in a nutshell. Yeah. But and but I think that is a case. I think there are love trying we um another common one people talk about a lot is uh Hunger Games. Yeah. See, we haven't mentioned any books here. Yeah. No, I, Hunger Games I know th- I've I've argued with uh, my sister about this and I think I know Zach is not a fan of it. But I think for one thing, the the love triangle in that Katniss, Gail and um Peta. Peta, yeah. <laughs> I completely blanked for a second. In one sense, it sort of distracts from kind of all the death and, and <laughs> darkness that uh, surrounds the rest of the story. Yeah. It feels a little light. I mean, maybe not for poor Katniss, but from my perspective, I think, well, well actually, first let me ask you, what, since you've only seen the movies. Yeah, I've only seen the movies. And having s- only seen the movies, I was never particularly, I mean, Gail's okay, but to me, Peta's one went through everything and... Not that Gail doesn't care, but Peter's, you know, Peter will do anything. Yeah. And so I've never, to me, it was never much of a contest. You know, it didn't seem like a triangle. <laughs> it seemed like, okay, she just can't quite get over, she doesn't really want loved, and so she can't do it with Peter. And then this Gail guy just keeps hanging around her. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's what it feels like to me from having just watched the movies. I know, uh, from what I'm understanding the books, since it's from her point of view, there's a lot more thoughts of Gail, so you actually have more of a sense of his character. Yeah. Then, I mean, he basically just shows up in movie three. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no, in the books, he's, he's largely an unseen off screen character, but like Katniss feels kind of him watching her, you know, basically throughout the games, even because she did grow up with him. I mean, yeah, she that's has d- deeper connections. That's something there. you know in the movies but you don't really feel until yeah. movie three you feel a little more of it yeah 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 no but i know some people feel like katniss is terrible for like leading these on but honestly katniss is incredibly dense <laughs> and i mean that in the best way possible i mean she has so much more survival is so much more on her mind than like any thought of getting to get being in a relationship yeah. or the future i don't think I think at some point she even says she really doesn't want kids of her own because, you know, she doesn't want them to have to go through the Hunger Games or anything like that. So it makes sense that she can't even understand her own feelings about the whole issue. And and for someone who's kind of thrown into all that and, bas- yeah, like I said, just trying to survive, I think it makes sense. And, I mean, just from not the triangle angle, but just the side plot, romantic side plot angle, the, the PETA thing I think is very interesting. It plays into the whole what's illusion and what's real Mm. idea of the Hunger Games and everything else. Yeah, that's and, true. And, you know, she doesn't even know, you know, from what I understand, especially in Catching Fire, she doesn't even quite... Yeah, she has a hard what, time keeping up with what Pete is doing yeah. a lot of times. Because everything's lies to her. You know, half of what she does is lies. Yeah. So, and it seems like, from what I'm understanding, his is not. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, he he is playing the game, but he's not playing the game against her yeah. at all. Yeah. But, I mean, you don't, you don't... There's often romantic side plots in books. We don't talk about books as much because the, the cultural... Not everyone knows, you know, yeah. them as well. But like I, I'm like 20 pages from finishing Words of Radiance, which is the the second Stormlight Archive Brandon Sanderson book. The epic long thing. Yeah, and there's and there's in the first book there was one side plot, 
um, you know, kind of the strong, stoic guy, and then this kind of romance that he's always had, but he's always pushed away for a variety of reasons, political and other things, and that breaks through. And, you know, it adds a sort of human humanity to this guy who's very, very intense, very driven. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in this one, there's a very, pretty, a relatively big subplot about this engagement that was kind of arranged in the two people. And it, it also kind of, well, it, a good plot thing is that it gets certain information from one side to the other that you need for uh, things to work. Uh-huh. Um, but also gives you another side of a character who... It's a very complicated character, this Shalin, this is a woman, and she's like half terrified and half really courageous, and she's awkward and also per- portrays herself as being very in charge. And Anyway, so it's a very interesting um, story. I think I, I think some people reading it might say, oh, this is kind of cheesy, this. But I, it's, <laughs> it's fun, and especially in a, in a book that has a lot of big things going on, having just a normal like little love story in there is kind of fun. Uh-huh. So at least, I mean, that's just one example. I mean... I could pull out all kinds of yeah. romantic side plots from real time, you know, be like <laughs> everyone, everyone finds someone in that book. Well, and the key for all of these things uh, as a subplot, I think, is that the romance has to, the audience has to buy it. It has to feel real in some and, way. And I think it is nice if it, and I, I mentioned before about revealing character or whatever, but I think just that it, it feels like it's connected to the other plot. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's. It's a reinforcing, building, contrasting something that's also going on. That's why why you have subplots. Yeah. Not just is they're simply for the spice, or, you know, or the the kind of token at the end. I need to protect people. Yeah. Thing. It just feels not as well. And you, I mean, nice. and it is true to to life too. There's usually more going on, you know, internally than just this one thing that you're yeah. you're working on. And yeah, having that expansion, especially if they play off each other. Yeah. Like real nice. Like Children of the Wells, for example. You know, we got this thing with Jason and Carrie. It's not really a romance yet, but you know, both every once in a while, someone. I mean, they're very close friends, yeah. basically. But every once in a while, someone will say something, and then they'll both blush, and then they know that there's, there's... There's something there, but they don't know what it is yet. Yeah, and that feels very true. You know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of relationships that start off that way. Um, I th- I know of someone in college that basically they were very good friends, and then yeah. and then they went, it's like, eventually, and one of them said, no, I'm never going to date you. Yeah, and then, that sounds like a familiar story, actually. It does, yeah. There might be even a movie about that. <laughs> 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 but uh, spoiler, <laughs> yes, it's him. <laughs> um, but you know, and, and that's that's a part of life, and so it makes for a good addition to your story. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to mention this. Because I was thinking about the romantic subplots, and we're talking about the kiss at the end. I never have understood this. Like, you know, you force a kiss in the most dramatic moment, which usually in the moment where like everyone's bloody and like tired, <laughs> and you know it's a, and you know and like like something a bomb's gonna go off in like ten seconds, <laughs> and then they do it, and it's really like, wait, you know, I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, in real life you'd be like, no, we gotta stop the bomb, and then maybe we'll get out of here, and then yeah, no, but but, <laughs> but the kiss on screen is like the, the culmination of it, of like all your emotions, so it's it's a and, great punctuation. And I guess I guess that's a good point that. <laughs> Well, so great in all our senses of that now. Uh, it's a good punctuation. Um, no, but saying it's the culmination of all you. And the thing is, if it's not the culmination of everything you're feeling right, then you haven't done it right. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Yeah, no. You know, if you're like, okay, it's going to happen, but I don't care about that. I care about the bomb going off. Uh-huh. Either you're just not paying attention to the film in the way the filmmaker makes, or once you do, or they didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah. And actually, here's here's another example I think I'll throw in here. Phineas and Ferb. Okay. <laughs> now, I, for people who've watched the show for like since it first started, there's always been this this thing like the girl next door neighbor yeah. thing has always had a huge crush on Phineas, yeah. and he has never known a thing about it, even though it's like blindingly obvious <laughs> to everyone. Well, recently they actually did an episode where all the kids are teenagers. It was like oh. ten years in the future. Nice. And he finally found out for the first time, and the in the episode is about how they, you know basically how they resolve it that's awesome and so it, it was really fun to get on tumblr afterwards and read all these reactions of people like i've been waiting for this for so long <laughs> <laughs> you know my child, you know all this, yeah this fun stuff and you know that's paying off a unrequited love side plot that strung out for several years yeah. and then finally giving it some resolution that's when you know you you've done it well and i think i think that's what makes the triangle so painful for people is that you feel like they don't want to pay off. They just uh, want to. Yeah. 
I think I think it gets to the point sometimes, especially in long running shows, mm-hmm. that you just like enough already. Yeah, you know, either do it or don't. You yeah, know? and, and when they try to stretch out that sexual tension yeah. for too long, and then again. it stops being. T- you just like okay, I'm whatever. Not. Yeah, yeah. Um, unrequited love though reminds me. Of, there's also sad romantic side plots. That's you true. know what I'm coming with with unrequited love here. Um, lay it on me. Uh, Lanier and Delenn. Oh, in Babylon Five. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, because that was a very interesting, very subtle plot for a while, where mm-hmm. De- Delenn's the master for the Mimbari, and Lanier's her aide. And you, f- you slowly find out that he not only has a deep respect for her, but has kind of this love for her. And she's, you know, already married to yeah. um, Sheridan. Sheridan. You know, and, event- and, and he's a very noble man, mm-hmm. God, uh, Mimbari. Yeah. So, you know, eventually he kind of purposely puts himself way out from her and, you know, tries to put himself in dangerous situations for her. Yeah. It's just kind of a sad whole story. And mm-hmm. you, don't, you don't always see that as often because, you know, the gut reaction is the, the love story. Angle. Right. And it's just one of those things that sometimes your emotions kind of get the better of you. Yeah. And it's, yeah, that's interesting. That is another angle to it. But in, the, in terms of the dealing with the, uh, like, long-term, like, a series as, that tries to stretch out the yeah. r- romantic subplot for too long, you know, sometimes when they finally do go somewhere that, like, Superman and Lois Lane yeah. getting married, you know, they were married for 20 years. Yeah, for, I mean, and you can play, and again, comic books work at a different uh, time scale yeah. <laughs> than other things. That is true. Somehow, somehow, 20 years of comics translates into a few years of their yeah. actual yeah. lives. Yeah, I mean, because comics, you don't expect a lot, I mean, you expect... A lot to change, nothing to really change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a nice thing too. If you're doing a long term form, it's always nice if you get to see after. Yeah. I mean, if it's a, if it actually is a side plot and not just uh, the main thing, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Like now, again, it depends on the story, and it usually has to be a long term thing because most times, if it's, if it's short, you're just doing the the most exciting from the outward appearance, which is the falling in love, mm-hmm. which is I think because it's. That has so many sparks to it. That's the part everyone gravitates for because it has the most inherent, easy, yeah, low hanging drama. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just like zing, <laughs> and you know the stuff after is a little more complicated. Yeah, and 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 probably a little more subdued in some ways in the yeah, more, in the tension and stuff. More subdued. I mean, I think it'll be interesting. Like in the series Castle, which is all about this sort of thing for a yeah. while. They just got married this season, and I think it'll be interesting. As I don't know how long the show has in its lifespan but i think it would be interesting to see them go through it i mean obviously they're still in this very like you know let's be flirty with each other as often as possible kind of stuff and it'll be interesting to see how they develop that over the long term it's interesting firefly had it was one that had very different types of love um subplots i mean you had the married couple Uh and you know wash was sometimes jealous of uh, mal because he had known her as wife Longer mm-hmm. and they had were so, had soldier stories and stuff. So you had like oh, the, yeah. you had the you had the married relationship, which you very rarely see on TV mm-hmm. outside of like sitcoms, right? At least at that sort of angle, be they were still you know they were still in love with each other, yeah. You know? And then you had like you know the, some of the unrequited stuff with uh, wasn't the engineer late girl wasn't she in love with the Rivers brother? Doctor. Oh, possibly. I don't. Um, it's been a lot, long time since I've seen. Anyways, a lot but they of had a lot of different those plot lines going, which yeah. just again balancing that many is really neat for a TV show. Yeah, you can, very you can do that over, especially a sci- science fiction series. Yeah. I mean, you don't have very many married people in sci-fi. In, no, not at in all. general. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of modern stuff where you always have the single, you know, because it's, it reflects culture in many ways, where we have a lot of single people running around. Yeah, and not necessarily a lot of married. Committed. Main characters. I mean, yeah. they're married, but they're not the main characters normally. They're normally... That's true, yeah. They're like the guardian or the mentor or something like yeah. that. That's true. And I think it's almost a shame because I think there's a lot of stuff you could... Ta- I mean, again, there are genres where, uh, you know, sitcoms tend to always have married. Not always, but much more often. Yeah. It's interesting. We started with, like, the the typical romantic side plots, and then as the more we've been talking about it, there's actually a lot of different ways you can take this. And I think maybe that's the thing to encourage people. Like, the traditional ones are traditional for very good reasons because yeah. they work. Uh-huh. But there's a lot of stuff that's not as explored as often, at least at least on screen. Mm-hmm. I don't read a lot of different types of books, so I know <laughs> mainly uh, Brandon Sanderson. Well, right now, but, yeah, <laughs> and, and Dostoevsky. Come on, well, you that's know? true. Yeah. Your, your classics, yeah. So you've got like really long fantasies or really, really long old Russian. books, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's lo- if it's long, we're sad. <laughs> <laughs> so. So either I can't pronounce the author's name or I can't pronounce the names of the characters inside the book. (laughs) 
Yeah, but, well, I guess you, you, you've you got practice the ski, ski, I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, but because, well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think I think that's a pretty good place. I mean, we could probably bunny trail for a while. But yeah. that's probably a pretty good place to uh, wrap up our story school. Yeah. Sounds good to me. So I guess we'll go to soundtrack. Right. Well, I thought um, for our soundtrack today, it's always good, you know, good, good dance scene. You know, you're doing a tango with a person you just met or you may you're arguing with and you just forced into it. You know, very Zorro, you know, hey, <laughs> dance with this person. And then you suddenly pull out all your moves. Make your father jealous. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, <laughs> or you know, upset. it's like the best tangoing ever seen, even though you've never practiced with each other. Um, anyway, I thought uh, music Although- like that would be good. Colson and May pulled it off in uh, Agents of Shield. I guess that they probably practiced that before. I think they probably <laughs> did, but it was. And May doesn't need to practice anything. No, but, she's no. They're um, both pretty awesome. But anyways, this is from a game called Quack Shot, which I don't know what it is, but it's apparently Ducktales related. I know. I, I kind of want to play it now. <laughs> and um, it's remixed by a guy named Gooey Frog, not his real name, and um, it is called Tango Lo Mango. All right, and um, enjoy. <laughs> And now, um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, everyone loves a little tango with their best bud that they don't know they love yet. And so, <laughs> I guess it's time to go to Crackpot's Corner. Crackpot's Corner. All right. So, Crackpot's, uh, Crackpot's Corner is a thing we haven't done for quite a while. Well, we did it in the 50th. Yes. But before that, we had kind of retired it. Yeah, basically. But it's basically where one of us has a... Crazy idea, and we just talk about it because it's our corner. <laughs> so, Tim, this is your all yours. 
Okay, well, this again, this is kind of unexpected because, like Nick said, we don't hadn't really planned to bring back Crackpot's Corner anytime soon. But a few weeks ago, I was cleaning out my laptop and I came upon a couple documents, which is always interesting when you find something that you forgot you jotted down. In this case, it's um, their notes that I put down from dreams that I had because I very rarely remember my dreams. I very rarely. These days, I don't tend to have a whole lot of dreams that are worth remembering. Yeah, exactly. like, apparently, like you wake I, up. I wake up and I don't really remember much. But apparently, there were a couple of times. I had an interesting dream last night. It's some sort. Of, we were doing some sort of action adventure sort of thing. And it's like I don't know. I'm always a lot of time I'm like this, like this, on this quest of some sort. Not like a, a fanciful quest, but like I'm, no, there was. I was there were like these caves and this pass, and like I felt like I was both like playing a video game and in it. But anyways, <laughs> I actually had a dream somewhere like that last night too. Like, <laughs> and that's the th- like for me, I maybe I may th- be able to remember my dreams if it was particularly memorable. I might be able to remember them for like the next day, and then they're but, gone, and then they're gone. Yeah, like even now, I don't remember that many details except I felt like it was in a virtual reality of a video game that I had played before, and yet hadn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we go, that's the hardest thing about them because you're like there's like three layers. You're in it and you're watching it and yeah. It's very cool, and simultaneously you thought, this is ridiculous. And unfortunately, they, you very rarely get to the ending of them. I like, know. At the point when you fir- when you finally get, start getting really interested in them, it's usually like the point where you start waking up. Uh, I, like I, I, I used to have for a while, I remember I had a series of dreams of me like as a fugitive, basically. Like it's kind of running from the law, from stuff. I remember one time, well, twice I think, but one's a lot older. There was this cave back in my in my parents' forest. We actually had a woods, but not a cave. Anyways, I remember getting shot like distinctly, like three or four times. Oh wow! It was very. I think I remember jerking in bed, but I don't know if that was part of the dream or just my memory after or actually happened or not. But, uh-huh. but yeah. Well, this will not just be an Inception Sorry, discuss- yeah. <laughs> discussion. That was a sidetrack. <laughs> Although I will say, I remember because I saw Inception like kind of. You know, that made like, weird dreams after oh, watching man, that movie. Oh man, the first first time I've I've never had so much fun being paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> Those were crazy dreams. But anyway, so I found I found these notes because you know, and I, I'd heard before like if you sometimes you might get good story ideas for so write down. So it's like okay, and since I tend to type faster than I actually handwrite stuff. I found it on my laptop. So it's really kind of surreal then coming back and finding these things. But you probably have no memory of dreaming. I, I don't really remember dreaming at all, but it's interesting. I'll, so I'll read, I'll just read what I have for this. I've, I found three of these things. Oh, wow. Now, one of them I'm going to save because it's a, related to a possible McCracken story. Okay. And I kind of like, it's like, ah, I'm going to sit on that one for, <laughs> for now. But these other two, I probably won't ever get around to doing anything with, but I thought, hey, we'll, we'll read it out here and maybe we'll have some, come, fun. Have some fun brainstorming it. So, okay, so here's what this first one says. Uh, teens, and then it says in parentheses orphans, because uh, <laughs> it's fun to write, write, read these notes, because like I had very vague ideas yeah. of what was going on even though when I wrote it down. So anyway, I find this abandoned amusement park castle that has magical properties. It may even give them some special abilities. It also has a time portal or something similar inside. They defeat a great evil at the castle and sort of establish their own team to combat ongoing threats. The story ends on a cliffhanger when a rival group nonchalantly invades their place and kidnaps some of the teens. <laughs> I love the nonchalantly. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the protagonist furiously fights them off, perhaps even killing some of the rivals, but is unable to save all his friends and has no idea where they've been taken. So this is pretty standard YA stuff. It yeah. kind of seems yeah, like. that'd be good stuff. I mean, it's, I don't know exactly. I see like Scooby-Doo for some reason. <laughs> it does, <laughs> does kind of feel like an amped up Scooby-Doo, doesn't it? It'd be awesome. I, I think it's because it's the abandoned amusement it, park castle. Yeah, thing. exactly. <laughs> it could be like reboot like Scooby-Doo, like Action Force or something like that. <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> yes, that would be awesome. So I. Zoinks. <laughs> <laughs> that's the battle cry okay okay not really yeah, awesome <laughs> and you know Thelma's like uh, Oracle and you know, computers and stuff and... <laughs> pretty much okay. so I mean that it, I don't know if there's a l- real far you can go with that it, sa- it sounds pretty generic and sort of stuff this next one though is I think where some of the real potential is and be fun because I read this thing this is I think there's some interesting potential. Now, it's also, at the same time, there's also some humorous n- moments in how, <laughs> how I wrote it out. But anyway, because like the first the first word, dad, question mark. I'm not sure if it was actually my dad or it was supposed to be someone else. But anyway, <laughs> and I are in the secret service. 
we are escorting former president, and then in parentheses, Bush, not, <laughs> not sure, to the presidential burying site for all the presidents. Then in parentheses, I say, this doesn't exist. Because <laughs> like one of those things you wake up, is like, is there really a, a site where all the presidents are buried? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it made sense. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we stand at JFK's tomb and remark about how sobering it is to have the body of the world's most powerful man at your feet. The president requests the other bodyguards leave, leaving just dad, question mark, I with him. He goes over to his grave, which is empty since he's not dead yet, obviously. He opens the empty coffin, pushes a button or something, and starts filling with some computer displays. I don't remember how those got there, he says. <laughs> Suddenly, he pulls out a gun and moves to shoot dad. I jump to tackle him and stop him, and just as I do, a tranquilizer dart hits him in the neck, stunning him. He croaks out, I'm not really the president, and then passes out. <laughs> <laughs> the tranquilizer dart, oh, then this is very specific here. In parentheses, it says, the tranquilizer dart came from above us to the right, but there's no sign of an attacker. <laughs> Like, this is very descriptive. I had to know, apparently, I, I needed to know the exact placement of this. Um, we, I think if it ever gets written, you need that exact phrase <laughs> in it verbatim. We get him to the floor, freaking out about what we're going to do. We wake him up. He has no memory of who he is or what's going on. There's a scuffle outside, and then I, I note in parentheses, the presidential burying area is inside this little room for some reason. <laughs> so I guess it's like a mausoleum type yeah. thing. Find out someone fighting with the other bodyguards. I shoot one of the assailants in the back, and that seems to end the scuffle. The other bodyguards demand to know what's going on, and we explain what we know. The president seems to be a fake, and we have no idea where the original president is. And then in parentheses, it says, also, the president seems to have turned from, from George <laughs> W. Bush to Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> Not sure how that happened either. <laughs> <laughs> this is proven in part by the tranquilizer dart in the president's neck and the fact that one of the other guards is suddenly also hit in the neck with one i'm not sure how that proves anything but that's what it says <laughs> uh, we try to figure out what to do as we leave now <laughs> honestly as written it would make like an awesome like science theater thing <laughs> i mean i probably that movie has probably been made <laughs> But no, I mean, no, I think that's a really no, interesting, some cool stuff there. Uh, interesting beginning. Like, I'm not really the president. Exactly. No, like, that's good stuff. And the Secret Service guys have no idea who it is. Or, I mean, that's like a Tom Clancy novel, <laughs> book, or movie waiting yeah. to happen. Like, I'm not sure how the Neil Patrick Harris gets in there, but <laughs> okay, so that's weird dream, you know, yeah, ha happening logic. Lo logic stuff. You got scrolls running around, apparently. <laughs> but and then I also love this idea that apparently the president has this like he knows where he's going to be buried. So what a perfect place to like hide stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, like computer, like this. Apparently, his coffin was actually like a front for like a computer, you know, like Penny's computer yeah. book. It's the president's computer coffin. <laughs> computer <laughs> coffin. It's awesome. <laughs> So like high tech vampires. <laughs> Man, I need to write high tech vampires now. So I, I don't know where the story goes next, but I really want to know now. Because apparently the Secret Service guys, there's this replacement. Like it's like the president has a body double, but somehow yeah. he fools his own Secret Service guys. And, and why? And why? And who's who's figuring it out? Who's shooting darts from <laughs> up and to the right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so many mysteries. You could do a lot of stuff with that. Yeah, so, and you could you could make a lot of fun. You know what? If I ever write another Buckethead, uh, that would there be, we go. That would be it'd perfect be a, for it'd Buckethead. be perfect for Buckethead. Uh, seriously, what now? So, the, the question is, why is the president hiding from his own bodyguards? I guess that means that he's you know hiding from. Is there a mole there? Is that, or yeah, is, or does he? Or is the president actually having some some secret? mission of his own that he's <laughs> that he, yeah that sounds bizarre, maybe but. he's already dead and they don't want to cause a panic yeah possibly I mean, maybe the double didn't know he wasn't the president until he got hit oh, the tranquilizer that's... was actually not to hurt him but to reboot his memory that's possible i mean and that th i thought that was interesting too a side effect of getting knocked out and then not knowing anything about what was going on yeah. or that he was even apparently maybe not even knowing that he was impersonating the yeah. president for who knows how long. For, yeah. Yeah. How long was it? <laughs> yeah. Was there ever a George W. Bush? You know, yeah. is he just saying that Al Gore should have won? I don't know. I, I'm not really the president. No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's rife with possibilities. This is a lot, you know, what would be great to get like 10 writers to just write one chapter to see all the different <laughs> see all the different all variations outlined, yeah. of it yeah you can get some see the great thing about writing off of dreams is that 
they're so ambiguous. Yeah. That you could do a lot of and but the sad thing is when you actually write them, they become tied down and they're not <laughs> quite as it's flights of fancy. It flies as fancy, but you can't write it quite as fly as fancy. Not not quite. Not yeah. quite. I mean you can get some, but it takes a lot of effort to write something that's really fly of fancy because you have to balance the realism and the Not unless you're Lewis Carroll. Yeah, not everyone likes that. Yeah. <laughs> you would have to go for a very specific type to keep the flight of fancy. Yeah. But at the same time, it's I mean, I've never actually written a story. I mean, I might now that yeah. I've found that I've rediscovered some of these. But it'd be it'd be interesting to try and experiment and and see where it goes with it. Because let's say that's your first you know, that's your first chapter and you're just like, <laughs> Okay, now <what?" laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's one of those, you know well the great thing about that, you're just left with what ifs. You mm. know, which is a great way to build a story. I know. It'd be really interesting. I haven't because I tend to have a pretty a vague idea of where I'm going with the whole thing. Yeah. So I've never really started off a story with like purely what if like I don't know where I'm going with this thing and just kind of yeah, unfo- unfold. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever gone compl- Well, the beginning of Strand and Fred was probably okay. like, very back in the day. But normally I have some idea where I'm going. Right. Yeah. Um, I feel like I would just be like petrified <laughs> starting off. Like, and the thing is, you can't uh, write very long until you already start. Figuring you gotta have start, some direction, yeah. Yeah, you start kind of planning where things are going to be going, and that's true. I imagine eventually you. Would I mean, kinda... uh, I know how I write. So when I tend to write, the more just making things up as I go, I start, you know, having a plan, and then you start thinking, what if I threw this? In? You know, you start, you can throw wrenches and it'll twist different, mm-hmm. but you know, you still kind of have a yeah. Your end goal doesn't change per se, right? But we've we've talked about outlines and pl- yeah, pre planning stuff before. But, no, but the dream is cool stuff because I, I don't know that I've ever had one based on a dream that I can remember writing down. Maybe it's written somewhere. I write a lot of times. I get things from music and I'll go and write down. Oh, yeah. Or mm-hmm. um, I have I have my little notebook here that like sometimes like it's weird. Like I read little Bible passages and there'll just be a phrase. I'm like, that's a neat phrase. I'm going to do something with it someday. <laughs> You're you're very good at coming up with stories based on an idea, like a philosophical idea. Yeah, I, that's I, I I'm kind of an idea writer more than anything, which is interesting because then you also consider yourself a character writer. I mean, when it comes to your novels, yeah, and, novels and stuff especially. Like that. Yeah, short stuff tends to be more idea, yeah, and longer tends to be character. Yeah, like the like uh, behind the curtain was very much based on. I just read the building of the tabernacle, you know, which is kind of horribly boring. <laughs> Um, yeah, and repetitive, but yeah, that's an interesting story of yours. If you have not read behind the curtain, you should go find it at worksofnick.com. Oh, that's that's one that we thought had thought about using for when we did the the episode on beauty. Yes, but it was, I was too trying, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember why I had re- I read that relatively recently. Yeah, that's why. Like, like there's this phrase in my uh, in my I was looking through my idea of a notebook to see if I had any uh, dream ones, and I don't. And most of these are not very helpful. I mean, they're not even ideas. They're just like, here's a phrase. Like, I wrote down, Jeremiah 50, 23. How broken and shattered is the hammer of the whole earth. <laughs> and, like, I, li- I love that image. And I feel like uh-huh. trying to capture that idea of the hammer of the whole earth being broken and shattered. That I don't know. I don't know how you capture that in a story. But, I, you know, if I sat around long enough, I'd probably come up with something. And like, ooh. You know, not no one else <laughs> might think it was interesting. Sure. But... <laughs> I mean, that's the trick with most of these things. Yeah. I, I heard uh, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, which I've not read of anything, but he kept a thing called the, this common book. Mm-hmm. And it just it had little phrases like that, just half ideas. You oh, know? interesting. I would, I would suspect Lovecraft to be one of these people that would come up with story ideas from their dreams just because of uh, the kind I of thing wouldn't be he surprised. Wrote. Yeah, because the only reason to know about that common book is apparently interactive fiction people were trying to bake different games. They went through all those random ideas and like, would try to make games off of them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because hmm. he made basically all his stuff public domain, didn't he? Or at um, least a lot. Maybe. I don't know. Well, maybe I not. I know nothing. Yeah. I'm not a Lovecraft person, so. No, but, sometimes I like to read one or two of his, just because he seems to be so good at what he, people say he's very good at his. At what he does. Sto- at what he does. Yeah. I'm not sure it's my style, but. <laughs> so. Right. so. Yeah. I wish I had a good dream to <laughs> You're just not crack potty enough. Nick. I'm not crack potty enough. I know, <laughs> not this way. Some my sister Summer had. I always remember she had a. I think she had a dream where she was fiddling while Rome was burning, and there's a Michael Jackson song playing. I always remember that. I don't know. I can't make a story off of it, but it seems interesting. This is a complete derailed train yeah. here. But I remember 
on, on the Muppet Show at some point when George Burns is on. It, at one point, he it, it, like in the cold open, he's playing a fiddle, and um, and George Burns asks him, "What are you doing?" And George and Gonzo's like, "Well, it's my new it's my new act. Gonzo fiddles while George Burns." <laughs> <laughs> and I remember seeing that like a while back, and then and then one one day it finally hit me. Like this was like a few. A few weeks ago, a few months yeah. ago, like you know, I'm 31. It's like, oh, you saw it's the Rome. Like, <laughs> Nero fiddles while while Rome burns. I never understood. It's like I don't get that one. <laughs> that's awesome. So the fiddling made me think of that. So, anyways, I guess that's our crackpots corner. Yep. Cool. So, hey, hey, if you were listening to the episode and you have a cool dream that you think make a neat story, yeah. leave it in the comments. We'd like to hear it. Absolutely. I mean, unless it's just you know weird, then we don't. Yeah. Want to <laughs> But cool. it has, if it has presidents that aren't presidents and Neil Patrick Harris, go for it. <laughs> Coolest thing I ever did in a dream. I remember I was getting, again, I was on this this kind of fugitive kick yeah. when I was on, I had this over for several months. But I remember there was that? These, these guys that were coming up behind me. And for some reason they were they were in like a row, so I did like the series of backflips to, to like <laughs> kick them. It was like awesome. I don't know why they were lined up like that, but it was cool. Nice. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so I think writing a story off a dream is kind of like writing an episode of Axe Cop, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, it's probably pretty similar. <laughs> it's it's like being the Beatles without the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Within you, without you. Okay. Or before we wrap up, Nick, uh, I should give you a, a. We won't do a full fledged project update, but you do have some good news about a certain project, right? Oh yes. Um. The I just finished my rough draft of uh, Jason number four for Children of the Wells, Woo-hoo. and I think you'll all be very. It'll be quite entertaining. I think once it gets through the editing process. I know my sister Danielle was a little worried, Nick, when she found out you were writing the next one. I was like, no, 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 no. He, he's he's going. He's going. Uh. He's I can do. I can do. Different time. style. Yeah. I don't have to just do Wells Orphan. And she's like, "Oh yeah, he wrote Unremarkable Squire. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I, I have I have flavors. You do. You you definitely do. So and it's a good mix of them. And no, Greg is getting uh, close to his epic. <laughs> his will be epic. <laughs> it's supposed to be very big, isn't it? I think he. Just, it's like double size of any of the other ones, probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he he said he doesn't really think of it as a novella anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll be his first novel then, won't it? That's true, yeah. Because <laughs> he's, he's written a, f- a screenplay, but not a f- novel. So. Wow. I'm honored for Children So if you've not been keeping with Children Wells, now's a good good time to get in. Yes. Yes, because we've got two print compilations. We'll have some more ebooks coming up uh, hopefully in a few months. We've got some flash fiction stuff coming out. Tim wrote a one that just came out. And Nathan yeah. wrote one that came out right before that. Nate and wrote one. one out soon. Nate wrote a Jason flash fiction. I wrote one about Amira, who's a character yeah. from uh, my book. Maybe cheating a little bit, and I didn't write any, so, like someone else's character. Nah, but. Nathan didn't either. Well, that's true. <laughs> I, I'm the only one who tried, and I'm not sure how I did back, but we'll see. Yeah, hopefully. I have not read it yet, but I'm sure it's so, good. All right. Stuff. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, do some um, contact info. Contact info. Ooh, contact info. Okay. Roll up a tone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, check out my email. Okay, <laughs> check, so, <laughs> check out my email, which you can email us at derailtrains at gmail dot com. Um, you can uh, subscribe to us on iTunes or, or Stitcher, and visit us at our website derailtrainsofthought.blogspot.com which is also home of the Weekly Hijack, which just goes backslash Weekly Hijack, I think. Yes, derailtrains.com derailtrainsofthought dot com. No, derailtrainsofthought.blogspot.com <laughs> slash the weekly hijack. Yes, it's, it's very uh, short for you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a bit easier just go to the derail train site and then find the, It's on the sidebar. On the yeah. sidebar, yeah. Um, there's one other thing. And also, just you know, visit Children of the Wells, childrenwells.com. We, yes. we vamped the website just a little tad to make mm-hmm. it a little easier for new people. Yeah. So definitely go check out some of the stories because we do have you don't if you don't have an ebook reader, but we do have some of the first few. Uh, Most of them, all there. but yours are actually. Yeah, currently, yeah. Yeah. Are, well, on the short story collection. Yeah. So if you if you like reading long fiction on your web browser, or if you just want to read a few chapters and if see if it's like something it, yeah. you like it, go for it. You want the action adventure you want is the Jason plotline, and the deep character drama is Bron and Cleo. Yes. This wasn't exactly intentional, but it's it works. It works out pretty well. It really does. It really does. Okay, I guess it's time for me to introduce my soundtrack. Yes. So, Tim, tell us what uh, astounding, obscure game yours is from. Um, 
It's it's from Final Fantasy X. Oh, that one! I've never even heard of that. Well, I, I did t- I did talk about earlier about uh, Final Fantasy about how they use romance a lot to bring in the emotion. Yeah. For the characters and stuff. So anyway, like nine, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is a very big deal, especially at nine. Um, and in ten, you've got the- oh, and, and eight actually, but you haven't played much of eight. Yeah, I've only played about ten hours of eight. Probably should finish that sometime. But in 10, you've got uh, the two characters are Yuna and Titus. And I guess Titus has kind of a bad reputation in some gaming circles because I don't know. I'll admit his voice acting isn't great. But I do, I do, uh, I do ship these two as yeah. <laughs> as the term is as the term is. So I, I, I rather like their romantic ballad. And this is a cover of it by Kate the Great Nineteen, also known as Erutan. I think that's how you say it. I remember one time I got I got uh, concerned about what what does Erotan mean? Is that some sort of like pagan thing? And then I looked at and I realized it's just nature backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh okay that's fine. <laughs> but uh, this is the the ballad from the game is called uh, and it's in Japanese so I'm probably butchering it but Suteki Nande or Perfect. Suteki Dane or something like that. And this is her cover of that. It's available through on YouTube or from her album. Bard, bard side, side quest. quest yeah yeah a bard side quest so i hope you enjoy uh meanwhile nick i guess we should they're still yelling over in that um auto mill shop yeah i see i, I, I knew that pseudo armor just sitting outside it's just kind of weird he's i i keep hearing weird noises coming from him yeah. he almost sounds like he's talking yeah i don't i it's just i mean it's, it's nice here and warm but I, it might be time to move on a little bit yeah probably there's a train around here somewhere i'm sure we can catch we can catch it's this seems like a pretty safe country yeah oh yeah not much going on yeah okay so until next time uh this has been nick and this is tim adios bye-bye Stuck in such bliss Wish I could grab